want to welcome you back to our latest installment of Acts Facts, a Jewish journey through the book of Acts. We are, we're in the final quarter uh, and uh, the clock is running down. Let's remind ourselves where we were last week and move forward in our journey one step at a time as we proceed together. Last week, we saw Paul, in the only message that we have uh, recorded, addressed to Christians. Uh, we see him del delivering a message to the elders of Ephesus. And he tells them, as his final words to them, to be on guard for themselves and uh, for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Those of you who were paying attention last week, you will remember that I pointed out that this last uh, portion of this verse is a tremendous, almost a throwaway, but there it is, a tremendous uh, uh, verse to demonstrate without any question that Paul recognized Jesus as God. Because when did God bleed? It is Jesus who bled. It is Jesus who purchased the church with his own blood. And yet it is God who purchased that. Therefore, ipso facto, Jesus is God. Just accept it. Don't try to understand it. Don't try to intellectually parse every detail of it. Just accept it as true. Because the Bible says so. And Paul tells us that, uh, I know after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And you know what they do when they take each member of the flock. They devour them and they, they eat them and some have larger appetites than others. But they will, from among your own selves, men will arise in other words, from within the church, from your, within your own family, your own mishbucha, your own clan. And men will arise speaking perverse things and draw away the disciples after them. People whom you've served side by side with and served and ministered to, they will turn and they will attempt to draw away the disciples by speaking attractive yet perverse things. Therefore, be on the alert. Be alert. We need more alerts. That's in the original Greek. Remembering that night and day, for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. If you're in ministry, you're going to be acquainted with tears. That's just the way it is. That's life. That's what people say. And everything I showed you, that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, the Lord Yeshua. And he himself said this, again, remember, is not in the gospel. This is something that Paul received, apparently, from Peter or one of the other apostles with whom he spent time with. The words of Jesus that is more blessed to give than to receive. Going back to our Torah portion this morning, ties in very nicely. Because, see, the Lord gave us instructions. He said, built into the warp and woof of life is the opportunity to give with every piece of fruit that drops off your tree. You have the opportunity to give to feed the hungry. Of course, in our modern society, our government comes and does the equivalent of vacuuming up every piece of fruit, every piece of grain left, left over. Uh, that's our taxes. And they decide to distribute your fruit, your grain, your vineyard to whom they wish to. They get the opportunity as a system as a governmental agency to do that which God 
gave us the responsibility. Who can give when the government has taken so much? But nonetheless, we still give. Even if the government has taken what they've taken so that they can be big daddy uncle sugar. We still give because it is more blessed to give than to receive. Those of you watching at home, let me say one very simple thing to you. We suspect you're there. We suspect you're watching. We see the numbers. We don't know how much you're watching of the service. We don't know if old Steve gets up to start preaching and you tune out or you fast forward or, or what happens. But if you're watching today, let us know you're there. I'll tell you how you can let us know you're there. Because it's more blessed to give than to receive, I'm going to ask you to simply let us know you're there by giving one dollar. Everybody can afford a dollar. Actually, one dollar was last year's offer. Um, because of inflation, uh, it's a dollar twenty. Saying this, a dollar twenty, and let us know, inflation, you know, and actually if we're going by gas prices, two dollars, okay? Uh, so it depends on if you're paying for milk or for gas. But either way, everybody can afford a dollar, a dollar twenty, a two dollars. Send us an indication that you're being blessed by our ministry, right? Uh, that will, your dollar, your two dollars, whatever it may be, will, your dollar twenty will encourage us and let us know that this ministry means something to you because we have no metric to be able to tell us who's actually uh, uh, participating and being ministered to through the service. So it is more blessed to give than to receive. So please do that as a favor to us, we ask. All right, um, let's move on to new material. When we had parted from them and had set sail, now this is going to be another part of that Beautiful travel itinerary that Luke lays out. And we have the sailing itinerary of the ministries. They tore themselves away. That's uh, uh, the nuance of this parted from them. They tore themselves away. It set sail. We ran a straight car course to Kos. And if you think that's easy to say three times fast, you got another thing coming. To you. But we, we ran a straight, Kos is, a, is an island, you can see. They're in Miletus, up in the top corner, and they are now sailing down to the Greek isle of Kos, and from Kos, you'll see they will move on. So Kos looks like that, boom. And from there, the next day, to Rhodos, to Rhodes, and this is traditionally St. Paul's Bay. This is, uh, uh, again, Bible. This is, this is all we get of Rhodes with, the, with Paul and his uh, time. We don't know. He went to the next day to Rhodes. Uh, they sailed. They landed. Whatever. According to Rhodes, uh, what they tell the tourists, uh, this is St. Paul's Bay, where they put in uh, for a day, and Paul was there on the island of Rhodes. Well, whatever the case may be, I'll tell you who was on the island of Rhodes. It was my lovely bride. This is what we did our honeymoon. We went through our honeymoon to the island of Rhodes for a week. And there she is in, in all her glory. And oh, there's another one looking over the bay. You, which is more spectacular, the Bay of Rhodes or my bride? I couldn't possibly say. Uh, <laughs> so again, from Eletus to Kos to Rhodes, guess where the next location they're going to go to Patara, okay? From there to Patara, okay? Not Panera, that's where you get your sandwiches and your soups, but this is Patara, this is what's left of Patara. Now there's the ruins there, that's what it looks like. They are on now the, uh, the mainland of Asia Minor. And having found a ship crossing over to Venetia, so... We, we're transferring ships now because you saw that was an island to island little hop, uh, island hopper. Now we're going to uh, transfer to a larger cargo ship that offers an express route all the way down to Phoenicia, just north of Israel. Five days open voyage across the Mediterranean Sea. We went aboard and set sail. So there they are. There's Patara, and they're going to cross over, and they're going to pass Cyprus. They're not going to stop at Cyprus, as you'll see, and they'll go to Phoenicia is modern-day Lebanon. That's where we're looking at. When we came in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, there it is on the left, 
We kept sailing to Syria. We kept going east to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship, because after five days of being on the open sea, they were tired. That's why they landed at Tyre. Oh, they can't. Folks, these are the jokes. They can't all be winners, okay? For there the ship was to uh, <laughs> for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And so they have uh, they got a, a week off uh, while the uh, ship is loading, unloading. And Paul and his eight friends, remember it's Paul and his companions, uh, they disembarked. They're gonna see what kind of hospitality the city of Tyre's believers are going to uh, offer them over the duration of their week-long layover. Well, uh, you'll remember from Acts 11, you could say Paul indirectly had some responsibility for the church at Tyre and in Phoenicia uh, because it initially resulted from the dispersion of Jewish believers uh, after Paul's uh, led, great, he led the great persecution. Well, this is Tyre today, looking, yeah, looking like it's seen better days. After looking up the disciples, because they didn't have, you know, cell phones or they couldn't send a letter ahead of time, they looked up the disciples and stayed with them seven days. They stayed with them that week while the ship was still in the harbor. And they, the disciples of Tyre, they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. Now, Watch this, because the disciples were warning Paul, and the Spirit's message here to the disciples was consistent with the revelation that Paul had already received. We saw him express it to the elders of Ephesus last week, that danger awaited him in Jerusalem. And so in light of the danger, the disciples prevailed upon Paul, hey, Change your plans. Avoid Jerusalem. Now, the fact that it says through the Spirit does not mean by the Spirit. It means that this is the disciples' apprehensive reaction to the Spirit's revelation. It is not the specific directive of the Spirit because we know that the Spirit has directed Paul to go to Jerusalem. He could not disobey the Holy Spirit's directive. It simply once again provides Paul a preparatory warning of what would await him when he arrived in Jerusalem. So at the end of the week, when our days there were ended, we left and started on our journey while they all, with wives and children, so the whole families, all the families of the believers, escorted us until we were out of the city and kneeling down on the beach and praying, this is the beach of Tyre today, we said farewell to one another. So, they sail now 25 miles, went on board the ship, they returned home again. We had finished the voyage from Tyre, 25 miles. They arrived at Ptolemais. And after, that's Akko, by the way. That's modern day Akko, actually Old Testament Akko, and modern day Akko. We arrived at Ptolemais, and after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them a day. So again, overnight layout, not seven days here, not a week-long layover. This is an overnight layover. There's some cargo again to unload, only enough time for one night. And Paul and company, and company once again look up the city's believers, pay their respects, enjoy their hospitality. Stay with them a day. So Tyre to Ptolemais. So Tyre, that's Lebanon. Now this is modern day Israel, Ptolemais. That's Akko. And they're going to go from Ptolemais to Caesarea. 30 more miles down the shore. So they are literally now, they were island hopping, they crossed the open, open uh, sea, and now they are going along the coast of first Lebanon, uh, Phoenicia in those days, and then down the coast of Judea to the Herodian port of Caesarea. On the next day we left and we came to Caesarea. You see here in this picture what is left 
of the tremendous wonder that was the harbor at Caesarea. You see the the shadow down uh, in the uh, left hand of that photo, and that, or the right hand, your right hand of the photo, you see the remains of what that great harbor, the outline of the borders of that magnificent harbor. So here they are back in Caesarea. By the way, if you have super sharp eyes, if you look over at the words we left and you go straight up to the coast, you see that was where Herod's palace was and behind it you see the great theater of Caesarea. Those of you who came with us on our Israel trip, you've been there, you recognize it, you know where we are. All right. I like Caesarea as much as the next guy, but I would like to move on. All right. Uh, it may be that I need to let you know to advance the next slide because I am not receiving, I'm not receiving control here. Can we get to the next slide or can we restore control? Ah, thank you. Here we are in Caesarea. They're done with sailing, okay. No more a sailing, a sailing away. Entering the house of Philip, the evangelist, who is one of the seven, and we stayed with him. Philip, you remember Philip. Philip was one of the original seven deacons. We haven't seen Philip in ages. We haven't seen him. See, you'll remember him. He's the guy who uh, was running along with the Egyptian, with the Ethiopian eunuch and shared the gospel with him. You remember Philip the deacon. Well, apparently he's now uh, graduated from Philip the deacon to Philip the evangelist. His headquarters are now in Caesarea, where he lives, and they're going to stay with old Philip, our old friend Philip the deacon. He had made Caesarea his home, settled down, and he had a family. Now, this, this is not Philip's home. This is traditionally Philip's tomb. Okay, so again, nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. So, but there, we don't know where Philip lived in Caesarea, but we do know this is his traditional tomb. I thought I'd show it to you. And now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. Now, that's not them on the urn. I just used that for illustrative purposes. Um, and the four virgin daughters, now I have to tell you quite honestly, we don't know if that means that these four daughters were dedicated specifically to the Lord, if they had consecrated themselves to his service and remained unmarried, or if they needed a matchmaker. It's unclear. But anyway, um, Philip apparently settled down and did okay for himself. Four Virgin daughters who were prophetess, prophetesses. So Paul's going to be surrounded with prophets. And now you're going to see in verse 10, he's going to be acquainted with an old friend who's a prophet. As we were staying there for some days. Now, they made really good time. Uh, he wanted to be, Paul wanted to be in Jerusalem for Shavuot, for Pentecost. And they actually arrived a week earlier than the holiday of, uh, of Shavuot of Pentecost, and so he really gets some time to settle down and relax and uh, decompress. Maybe he had some ship lag, I don't know, uh, from all that travel, but he got to uh, spend some time in Caesarea, enjoy the hospitality of Philip and his family. I don't know if Paul and Philip had been previously acquainted. Very, uh, doesn't say, but I can tell you for sure, this is the first time that Luke gets to meet Philip, and why does Philip get so much literary real estate? Apparently, Philip had some stories that he shared with Luke, and, uh, uh, and Luke, being the good biographer that he was, he made sure he included the top stuff. Um, their relationship obviously prov uh, provided rich resources uh, to uh, compile material for the church history. But here we have... Our old friend Agabus. This is old home week, isn't it? We met Philip again, and now we're meeting Agabus. We're staying there for some days, and a prophet named Agabus 
came down from Judea. Now, we haven't seen Agabus in a long time either. We actually only saw it one time, brief entrance back in chapter 11, end of chapter 11. And you'll remember, Agabus directed a prophecy to the church in Antioch to say, hey, there's going to be a famine. Make sure you prepare. That was the last time we saw Agabus. And now Agabus shows up again. Uh, here's uh, where we saw him again, just to re refresh your uh, acquaintance. Now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine over all the world. That's just to refresh your memory. Back to our story. Coming to us, he, Agabus, took Paul's belt. And Paul's pants fell down. No, he, he, he took his sash and he bound his, Agabus, bound his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit said. That's the equivalent to the Old Testament prophet saying, thus saith the Lord. This is the New Testament equivalent, okay? Same, same words, same language. This is what the Holy Spirit says. Thus saith the Lord. In this way, remember, he takes Paul's belt, binds his own feet and hands, hog ties himself, pardon the expression. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind this man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles, at which point Paul said, anybody want to buy a belt? Uh, <laughs> give it away. No, no, this was a prophecy that Agabus delivered to Paul. Holy Spirit was, uh, message was that as Agabus had been bound, Paul too would be bound by the Jews and consigned to Gentile custody. Now some, they say that Agabus' prophecy was inaccurate. Somehow Agabus got the Holy Spirit's message wrong. It was distorted in transmission because technically speaking, it was the Romans and not the Jews who bind Paul and because Paul, rather than being handed over by the Jews, is rescued by the Romans, rescued from them by the Romans. Uh, but as we're going to see, this can't be uh, supported from the text. And Paul himself says that this is indeed uh, what happened. And he was delivered into Jerusalem, or delivered from Jerusalem, into the hands of the Romans. Paul understood that the Jewish people were responsible for his arrest. I don't know how you'd find a more explicit confirmation of Agabus's prophecy than Paul's own statement. Kind of the way that where it says that Pontius Pilatus, Pontius Pilate um, uh, 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 whipped Jesus uh, and, uh, and beat you. Pontius Pilatus did not do it, but he was the responsible party. He orchestrated the soldiers beating Jesus, but yet we say that Pilate whipped Jesus and beat Jesus. Uh, Pilate is the responsible party, and the Jews, as we're going to see next week, that the Jews in Jerusalem are going to be responsible for this man being delivered into the hands of the Romans. And when we heard this, we, now notice the we that's there, that's Luke talking, he said, all of us at Caesarea, Agabus and me, Luke, and Philip, and maybe Philip's daughters, the prophetesses, and, and any other believers who were there, we, as well as the local residents, began begging him, Paul, not to go to Jerusalem. But the prophecy, again, that's no surprise to Paul. It simply confirmed that which he already knew was going to happen. Remember in Acts 28, 17, it says, brethren, this is toward the very end of Acts, spoiler alert, um, brethren, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Paul being very, very clear that Agabus' prophecy had indeed come true. 
See, Paul is not going to be able to avoid his destiny in Jerusalem. Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping, breaking my heart. Are you trying to soften my resolve? I'm ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When you're called to follow Jesus, at the moment of faith, we've already died. We've already been bought at a price. Our old self is dead. And the life we live is a life led in the service of Jesus. And Jesus himself told us to take up our cross daily and follow him. And we know that for Jesus, execution awaited. And for Paul, who is following Jesus, you know, often quoted, follow me, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And that means being willing to follow Jesus even to the point of death. So, like Jesus could not avoid and would not avoid the fate that awaited him in Jerusalem, neither did Paul. Paul would not have wanted to. You remember the commission that Paul received from the Lord Jesus himself. The Lord said to him, Go, he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Paul's threefold commission, Gentiles, non-Jews, Jewish people, sons of Israel, and kings, and I will show him, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul knew just as surely as he knew he was called to the Jewish people and to Gentiles and to kings that suffering was part of the recipe baked into the cake from the moment that he was called from his commission. It's also going to provide an opportunity, an occasion to ultimately realize this commission. To this point, Paul has witnessed to Jews and to Gentiles not so much kings. But as Paul, going back, this verse right here, I, I, I can't get over it because it really does provide a glimpse into Paul's psyche. The persuasive attempts of his brethren. Even his close friend Luke, we attempted. Even Luke, even his compass, traveling companions with him. He's got eight in all, including Luke. Right? I mean, they were softening his resolve, breaking, breaking down his determination. But Paul remained resolute and ready to face his fate come what may. Paul set his face resolutely toward Jerusalem, just as Jesus did before him. He was ready to be arrested, prepared for an arrest, and he was even prepared, just as Jesus was, to be crucified. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent. Luke speaking again for the group. We fell silent, remarking the will of the Lord be done. This is in a sense a, uh, a, a, a parallel passage with the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus in the garden and saying, not my will, but yours be done. In this instance, it is those who tried to dissuade Paul who realize that it must be the will of the Lord that must be done. 
Paul will meet his destiny in the holy city of Jerusalem. After those days, we got ready and started on our way up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea also came with us, taking us to Manasin of Cyprus, a disciple of long standing with whom we were to lodge. There were very few holiday inns, or excuse me, holiday inns in Jerusalem in those days, very few best west, best easterns in those days. And so if you wanted to stay, if you wanted to visit, you stayed with people, and Manasin of Cyprus must have had a very nice spread in Jerusalem. So traveling now from Caesarea, it says up to Jerusalem, even though they're going south to Jerusalem, southeast to Jerusalem, simply because you see the topography, you see that Jerusalem is on an elevation, and one always travels whatever direction you're coming to Jerusalem, north, south, east, or west, east or west, you always travel up to Jerusalem, and in this instance, that's what they're doing. After we arrived at Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And we now, with this verse, we come to the end of Paul's third missionary journey. You see in this map how Paul had traveled from Antioch in Syria, made his way on that third missionary journey through Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, spent some great time in Ephesus, made his way from Ephesus up to the northwest of Asia Minor to Troas, which was ancient Troy uh, near uh, uh, Istanbul today, uh, crossed over to Macedonia, to uh, traveled again to Philippi, to Thessalonica, to uh, Athens, and then down to the Peloponnesian Peninsula, to Corinth, and then made his way back, and we've traveled with Luke, uh, and uh, seen the itinerary as Paul finishes his five-year third missionary journey. With Paul's arrival in Israel, the third missionary journey came to a conclusion. And in contrast to the two previous journeys, uh, first and second missionary journeys, um, and what Luke included and what he excluded, Luke's account of the third mission reveals a lot less action and less evangelistic stories, less evangelism, even though it was going on. I mean, certainly, uh, Paul uh, never stopped being an evangelist, but Luke doesn't include as much of that action or evangelism, but a much more revealing glimpse instead into the heart and the motivation of the Apostle Paul. Uh, it's the first two missionary journeys, they're so filled with adventure and evangelistic encounters, it's, it's almost like... Uh, uh, you get a two-dimensional picture, but Luke corrects the image in his coverage of the third missionary journey. We get to know Paul the man. In these chapters, Paul portrayed the apostle as a, as a man, a, an emotional, a pastoral, a courageous, a headstrong, certainly a three-dimensional human being who just happened to be God's chosen instrument to evangelize a vast portion of the Roman Empire. Over the course of three missionary journeys, those missionary journeys took place over the period of less than one decade. You, it seems sometimes when we think of Paul's missionary journeys that, well, those journeys must have taken uh, three decades, uh, no we, the entirety of Paul's life we see from the time he becomes a believer to the time he's executed after the uh, narrative of Acts, that's three decades. We only get to see Paul for three decades. But the missionary journeys themselves took place from spring 48 to spring 57. Nine years. Nine years. Not even a decade. Paul and his companions during this time, had been instrumental participants in a movement that managed to boldly turn the world upside down. If you 
take it apart as Luke did and really stare at it and look at the, how did all these things get accomplished? A, tremendous determination. B, a very clear call. And C, the most important ingredient of all, the mighty power of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. So I couldn't help but wonder as I studied this passage and ruminated over the decade of Paul, less than a decade, of Paul's three missionary journeys. I said, I wonder what shall occupy our time over the next decade. I, uh, I've seen how quickly how exponentially quickly the decades fly. Swiftly fly the years, as sunrise, sunset so eloquently put it. Indeed it does. Uh, one of the things I'm doing right now is digitizing um, photos over my life. Uh, and... Uh, digitizing these photos and looking over uh, my life and my relationships with my family and looking through photos and saying, she's gone, she's gone, he's gone, he's gone, she's gone. Swiftly, our time goes and the decades fly. And here I am. And at this stage of my life, I have gone beyond the descriptive age characterized by being a spring chicken. I'm no longer a spring chicken. And looking at some of you today, I can say you're in the same position that I'm in. And some are on their way and some have gone beyond. Uh, but nonetheless, all of us have the same amount of days, the same amount of hours in every day, the same amount of days in every year, and as we measure, it's very easy if you're not aiming for something and you have no direction and you have no goals and no vision. It's very easy, before you know it, for a decade to go. Where did the time go? So I ask you and I challenge you with this question today. As I challenge myself, as I've looked back and look at today and then look forward, knowing that there are more days on one side of my ledger than on the other side, I ask myself and all of us, to what end, to what cause, for what purpose will our efforts and energy be devoted over the next decade? What do you hope to accomplish? I can tell you that it is quite likely that some of us in this room will not be here, will be with the Lord in a decade. Statistically speaking, some of you watching at home as well. Most of us will likely be, again, assuming that the Lord does not return in the next decade for us, assuming that time remains linear as it is and uh, another era does not uh, dawn, what are you planning on accomplishing? What will you devote yourself to? You know it's very easy to do to get distracted. It's very easy to say, I need to watch this amount of news every day so I can keep up with all the atrocities and all the mishigas and all the craziness that's going on in our world and I can get uh, appropriately apoplectic and upset uh, concerned and uh, being in tune with the times is important. It's not all there is, however. You know, it's another thing that's very easy to get involved in and get uh, uh, having a Netflix queue and wanting to or pick your, pick your streaming service of choice, Amazon Prime, HBO Max, whatever it may be, and saying, look at all these movies that I have and show and TV shows 
that I could be watching right now. Look at how much time I can spend binging. I love to, I'm probably the biggest binger. I dare you to, co to compare with me. I'm probably the biggest binger of TV shows in this room, okay? And I know from personal experience how much time entire weekends can be sucked up. I mean, when I was uh, binging 24, that was like an entire month. Gone, okay? With me and Jack Bauer, my wife. My wife, myself, Jack Bauer. I want a name. Um, it's easy to lose time. That's fun. It's fine. But make sure you don't lose track of the goal. What is the goal? What is your goal? What is the vision that you... Some of us, it may be sufficient to say in the next... We don't, we're not all Apostle Paul, okay? He's a unique individual called uniquely. But maybe what we're called to over the next decade is to make sure that our children have the torch of responsibility and godliness passed down to us or passed down to them or our grandchildren. Make sure that they are strong in the Lord. Listen, we can't be completely responsible for the decisions that our children or grandchildren or family members or parents or sisters or brothers, we can't be, we're not mind controllers. Right? And we're not the thought police. Right? That, that, that apparently is the government's job. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, we can fulfill our responsibility. Maybe over the next 10 years, our responsibility, what we're called for our vision can be to be the best employer or employee that I possibly can. If an employer, make sure I take care of, of business and make sure that my customers are treated fairly and rightly and are the best product possible and that my employees are all treated fairly and paid a fair uh, wage for their work. If an employee, maybe my 10-year goal is to be the best employee that I possibly can be and bring glory to my company and to my boss and accolades and not worry who gets glory and who gets credit or whatever. Maybe it's to be the best husband or wife and make sure that over the next 10 years you shore up a crumbling foundation of marriage. Maybe it's to become involved politically. I certainly have found a, 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 a side calling in, uh, in that over the past few years and getting involved in the public sphere and making uh, a difference, trying to at least make a difference uh, in my own very small way. There are many things that we could be doing. Maybe over the next 10 years, I, I really want to work on, Lord, being a better evangelist, a more, uh, a more studious, uh, more st uh, industrious student of the scripture. Maybe I want to go through the Bible for the first time. Maybe over the next 10 years, I want to have gone through the Bible uh, three times. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I want to, over the next 10 years, maybe my goal is to get as healthy as I can uh, because we don't know what kind of stress is coming in our culture. And if we're going to serve the Lord, we need to be on our own two feet and is uh, at, at the top of our game physically because we don't know what opposition and what stress is going to be coming down for us. Uh, let the Lord lead you. But think about that this week. What's going to occupy your time over the next, or is it going to become 2032, again, assuming the Lord doesn't come. It's going to be 2032, and you say, where'd the last decade go? Boy, how time flies. Huh. So I finally ask you once again, to what end, what cause, what purpose? Well, our efforts and energy be devoted. Selah.